Well, hello, my name is Jim Reyes, and today I'm going to be talking art supplies for a comic book inker. Let's get started. One of the things that you will need is a comfortable, well-lit place to work. This here is my workstation, and it has all my tools necessary that I need to ink a comic book page within arm's reach. One of the comic books that I've inked was Zombies and Mass Destruction by Underworld creator Kevin Grievous. As you can see here, this was a book by the publisher Red 5 Comics. So what did it take to ink this comic book? What kind of tools did I use? You may have heard comic book inkers talk about brush or nibs. And you may have questions wondering what kind of brush, what kind of nib. What I'm going to do is discuss the types of tools generally that an inker uses. And these are specifically the type of tools and brand that I use. You don't necessarily have to use the exact same brand, but uh, you generally want to find uh, something very similar, very close. The first tool that I, I use, and this is actually my primary tool, this is called a Crow Quill or the Hunt 102, and it is by Speedball. These are what are referred to as nibs. This is the 102 nib. This is my primary tool. This is the tool that I, I favor. Um, the reason I use this tool is because it can give me a wide variety of lines and I can get a lot of work done with just one tool. Although I don't ink an entire comic book page with just this one tool. There are many other tools that uh, are often used and uh, a lot of times it uh, takes several tools, sometimes one to two, sometimes more to complete a comic book page. The Crow Quill is held by this plastic handle. This plastic handle is a Speedball brand. This is the generic handle. They're, the handles are generally about a dollar or maybe a dollar and a half, where the nib costs more because it is a steel nib. And you can get fancier handles. Um, you can get uh, a metal handle, you can get a wider handle, you can get them in different colors. Um, I stick with the plastic handle because I like the lightweight. And when I am inking for many hours, it is easier on my wrist and my hand. The purple little foam that you see here is the foam pencil grip. And I like using it because it widens the, the handle and it softens the grip and it widens the grip for me so that as I am inking that my hand doesn't become very fatigued or tired from holding this position for very long um, or after a long period of time. The nib can be removed and when you do order your nibs um, you can if you're going to experiment for the first time you can buy these in a two-pack and I'd recommend doing that but if you've already become comfortable with the nib or you've, you know, have dedicated to wanting to learn the nib, then you can invest in buying the 12 pack. This is the uh, speedball pack of the Hunt 102, also referred to as the Crow Quill. Uh, this is the, uh, the one, the one, uh, one dozen here. Um, and uh, you can get the number provided there if you want to Google that. So I buy these, in, I buy several boxes at a time, because generally I, I can go through about three or four nibs within one page, depending on the nib. Not every single nib is going to come out working properly, they are machined, so sometimes you're going to get a bad nib, sometimes you get a bad box, but uh, it's kind of a gamble, but most of the time they, they work, they work very well. And you can see here there's many of the steel nibs that are in here good place where I go is, uh, you know, search online. Uh, generally, you can find uh, different deals, sometimes some closeouts and stuff. Another tool that I, I use, and you may often hear comic book inkers refer to uh, using brush. So what kind of brush does a comic book inker use? Generally, there, there are two different brands that a comic book inker uses, but the brush that you're looking for is a Kalinsky Sable brush, which means that the hair on the end of the brush is a Kalinsky. Generally, you, you're looking for a watercolor brush if you're working with India ink. Um, this is the Windsor Newton 
Series 7 brush. This is a brush that's pretty standard in the industry. It's been used for years and years. Um, it was even recommended on uh, how to draw comics the Marvel way. Uh, they even recommended the Winsor Newton Series 7. This brush is a size 2 brush. And what you see on, on the brush as well is another foam grip for the same reason that it softens my grip. And you can see the handle isn't very wide. And this widens the handle so that I'm not making such a tight grip. As I'm inking, it allows more comfort. I find that it allows more control. Um, and the foam grip is designed for pencils. So I had to put a little bit of tape in there, put a little bit of masking tape, and then was able to slide the foam grip over. And I went up pretty close to the, to the end there, still bringing it back just a little bit so that as I dip it into my ink jar, I don't get it uh, too much too deep into the ink jar where I get too much ink on the end. The plastic that you see on the end of this is actually a little case that Exacto Bleeps came in and it had a little cap on this end. And uh, I just put my Exacto Blades inside of a different plastic case and I was able to re reuse this and uh, it fit right over the foam grip and now it protects my Kalinsky Sable. So the better you treat your brush, the more care you give your brush, the longer it's gonna last. Uh, this one has been around with me for about five years. Um, and uh, that's not using it every day. But even so, even if I was using it every day, as long as I put the care into it and the maintenance, this brush can last uh, a long time. So I use different size brushes but I stick with the Winsor Newton Series 7 because uh, it is a brand that I've become comfortable with. I am a creature of habit. It is something that has gained my confidence and I know when I receive their products, I know that generally they're gonna be of quality, but you don't have to go with the Winsor Newton. There is also the Raphael brand. The 8404 also makes a Kalinsky Sable and it's also a good brush and it's becoming widely used now. Uh, with inkers because the Raphael is less expensive. This is a Winsor Newton Series 7 and this brush is a miniature. Uh, miniature meaning that the sable on the end, the little hairs on the end of the brush are shorter. So there's less bend, the brush feels a little stiffer. And uh, I, I like that because I can work with fine little lines with it and there's less bend. And since I don't use this brush as often, there's no foam grip on it. Since I don't work with it for a long period of time, generally it's just to do little touch-ups and little things. It's good to have a wide arsenal of tools. I also have the miniature brush from the same series, Winsor Newton. This one here is the size two brush. Um, so it's just a little, has a little more sable hair on there. It's a little wider, but it's also a miniature, meaning that the sable hair does not come out as long. It's shorter. And those are all used with my India ink. So once the brush wears out, after many years and the brush no longer is giving you the fine line, it's no longer snapping back to a fine point, I keep them. And what I do is after they have worn out, and you can see that the Kalinsky Sable on the end of this one, it's a bit frayed. It's not giving me the point that it used to. Um, sometimes you can take an X-Acto blade and slice off some of the excess hair that, that is bending to reshape your brush. Um, there are reshapers, there are um, plenty of preservers and things you use along the way to extend the life of your brush. But once they've get, gotten to this point where you can no longer get the line out of them, keep them. Because I use this to spot my blacks. And if you've seen the video where I am working over inking David Finch, Batman, uh, and it's video number part three, where I'm spotting my black, this is the actual brush that I spotted the blacks with. So uh, I keep them. And I, I keep the same uh, Winsor Newton Series 7 Sable uh, Kalinsky Sable because it works well with the India ink that I use 
and it holds the ink very well. So even though I'm spotting blacks, I still want control. So this is a good brush that has been repurposed. I also keep all my older brushes. This is a brush that goes back even further than the one that you just saw. This is about 15 years old. This is a Winsor Newton Series 7, size 2. And the, the ends have become frayed, but the reason they're this frayed is that I like to do a, a, what's called a dry brush effect. This brush right here, um, and you don't necessarily have to go out and you know buy several brushes and wait till they wear out. If you want to do a bright, dry brush effect and the, you only have one Winsor Newton Series 7, you can buy a generic brush. You can buy a cheap watercolor brush at an art store or a, a craft store or a grocery store. Um, and as long as the, the ends are frayed like this and you have very little ink that's starting to dry on it, you can do what's called a dry brush effect. And I'll make a video, um, tutorial video, showing how I do different textures, different effects. But I like to, uh, I'm grateful that I, you know, I have the opportunity to keep this Winsor Newton Series 7 because I like the way it holds the ink and the way it releases the ink on the paper. And I don't keep a cap on it so that it stays nice and, and fuzzy and frayed like that so that it gives me a better, a better effect the more damaged that brush is. Now I have several other brushes. Not only do I have the round brush, I also have what's called a flat brush. So when I want to do different type of line, line work, sometimes I want to uh, do these type of different little kind of thicker speed lines. So I have a flat brush. And I have two different types of flat brushes. And these are both watercolor brushes so that they work with the India ink and they're two different sizes. Not only will you be working in black, you'll also be working in white. So you're going to need a separate brush for your white. You can dip in the same brush into your your opaque white um, and your India ink. I don't like doing that um, because you know you have to stop, you have to clean, make sure that the opaque white is, is all clean off that brush. So I like to use a separate brush and I didn't invest as much money into this one. This is actually the, this is a watercolor brush. It is a uh, Kalinske Sable, but it's not the Series 7 brand. It is from Winsor Newton. I do stick with that brand because I'm comfortable with them. Uh, I, I like their products. And so this brush is used exclusively for white and you can see some of my white ink and opaque white on there. Since I do use this quite often when I'm doing reverse inking or effects and things like that, uh, I have the foam grip on there. The base uh, on this handle is a little bit wider than the Series 7 and you can see how it thins in the middle so that when you're holding it, it rests in between your thumb and your, your finger. Um, and it's designed that way from the manufacturer, but I still wanted a foam grip on there. Uh, just to help on the control with it. This little plastic here is actually the case that the brushes are shipped in. This is from a Series 7 brush. And what I did was I went ahead and I, I cut the case and then was able to slide it over all over this foam cushion, protecting the ends there of my sable brush. Um, and uh, once the brush tip is wet and I have a preserver, uh, that I can reshape the tip of that brush. And I also have a another uh, cheaper uh, watercolor brush uh, from a, a generic brand and um, I use that as well for my, my, uh, my white, working white over black, um, sometimes referred to as reverse inking. Oh. You may find or have heard that uh, artists work, inkers work with uh, different type of pins. And these are what are called tech pins. Uh, tech pins are, you know, just that. They help you work over technical illustrations and technical parts of your illustration. And they are gonna give you a flat line. You can sculpt and build up some lines with the repeatograph, but they're not going to be as 
smooth as you could get with a 102. The 102 is designed to help you sculpt your lines um, and you can shape lines with it uh, much smoother than you can with a technical pen. Um, technical pens. All right, this this brand here is Kohenor, um, and this particular model is called the Repeatograph. And Kohenor is also the brand that I use for ink, so you can place their ink inside this ink well. Um, I don't use tech pens very often. Um, this tech pen I've never used. I rarely ever use tech pens. And this is just my preference, only because I, I can do everything with the nib and a straight edge and um, or a calligraphy um, nib that is uh, in the, the C style calligraphy. And it'll give me a flat line just like, like this. The same size as this one. This is just a different size and it works the same way, way with a, an ink well in there and, and you place the ink inside of this ink well. Um, but uh, I have them just in case they're ever needed. You know, it's good to have and not need than to need and not have. Because when you're on deadline, you want to make sure you have a good supply of tools and you're not out searching for tools or waiting for tools because you never want to be late. This is a, a brand called Pigma. This is a Micron pen. Um, I, I bought it because it, they're, they're very popular. Um, and I sometimes use it when I'm working on like thumbnails and really to be honest, I, I've never inked with this. I simply really, I use this to sign my name on the top of the Bristol board. So on the top of the Bristol board where it says artist, I use this pen to fill out that information. I, I really, I've uh, never inked with a Pigma, but you can, you can do little sketches with it. And, um, I've done thumbnails and things, uh, with, with the Pigma pen. And Pigma has a competitor. They have a different, um, uh, it's the same type of pen. Um, this is a, a pit pen, and it's by the manufacturer uh, Faber-Castell. This is their medium. They go by different uh, sizes where the, sorry about bumping the camera there, where the um, Pigma pen has said size 8, pit pen says medium, and they're, exactly the same size and I really just same thing I use this to fill up the top of the Bristol board information or to um, work on thumbnails I really don't uh, ever ink with those and I mentioned earlier that there was a nib a calligraphy pen and these are uh, this, there's a C style and a B style calligraphy uh, nib and this here, uh, these two are used to uh, line my panels or borders um, on a comic page. The B6 is exactly the same size as that red Rapido graph. And if you can see here, it says B6 on the, on the tip, they're labeled on there, but this is the B style. Um, and it gives me a flat line and uh, I use a straight edge with it. This is the C5, which is actually wider than the B, if I need a, a thicker line. And these are very useful for me um, since I don't use tech pens. This is, this is what I, I use very often for the thicker straight lines. Now, what's very important in inking comic books, of course, it's called inking. So what's important is ink and the type of ink that you use. Now, because I use nib and brush, I, I'm looking for a really good uh, India ink. And this is the brand that I was, I was introduced to. And I've become very comfortable with it. I, it's, it's tried and true. It's, it's a good ink to use if you're unsure what type of ink to use and you want to work professionally, I'd recommend getting this Konor uh, Universal Ink. Uh, you can get Higgins ink. You can get uh, different types of um, Black India ink, different brands, if you just want to try out inking. And it's something that you're experimenting with, you know, to see uh, how much you enjoy and just kind of an introduction into inking. You can get different uh, different brands that are cheaper. This particular bottle here is the uh, eight fluid ounce. So 
Um, I buy it in a large amount because you know uh, you ink a lot of pages um, as an inker and it's you never want to run out of ink um, and so I have a backup there just you know after this one's gone uh, that I've got this one and then you know you're working in with a, a nib and you're doing a lot of tiny fine lines so you're really unless you're spotting a lot of black you're really not going to run through this ink extremely fast how this works is that it has a spout and the reason they design it with the spout is so that you can tip it over and drop, um, put little drops in to this ink well so that it fits because it's designed to be used with their tech pens. But I don't use tech pens. I use this with a watercolor brush, the Winsor Newton Series 7 brush. I use it with nibs. So what I do is I take this and I pour it into a different jar. This little jar is actually a Winsor & Newton uh, ink bottle. It's Winsor & Newton India ink. Um, I don't like Winsor & Newton ink. Uh, I don't like the way it flows off the nib or the brush. And I don't like the, um, I don't like how it's not as solid black as the Universal ink. Universal ink is a low reflective uh, ink, meaning that when you're working underneath your light, you don't get a high reflection that will blind you or make it difficult to see the lines that you're putting down. So it's a good ink to work with. So I poured out the, the ink that was from the uh, Winsor Newton brand. And um, I like this jar because it's uh, it's triangular, you know, base. Uh, it's larger on the base and smaller near the, near the end so that um, it has a low center of gravity and when I place it, if you saw the video at the beginning of my workstation, it's placed right next to my drafting table uh, where the incline is on a flat surface. So it's never been tipped over. Um, and sometimes I buy different little jars and I empty out the ink that comes with the brand. Um, and, uh, and I keep the jar just to pour ink in it. Uh, but this little one has works really well and it lasts a long time. So... I really didn't need something this large and I didn't really like, you know, all the extra ink that would sit in there. Um, so I stopped using it and I, I used the um, small little Windsor Newton jar. So when you're working in with inks, you're going to need to clean your brush. You're going to need to wash out your brush or dip them in to get off the dried crust uh, of the ink. So I went out and I bought a baby food jar. And uh, no, I didn't eat the baby food. I, I don't know how babies do it. So uh, what I did was uh, I, I washed out all the baby food. And then I just poured some warm water in there. And the reason it's black like this is because as you're dipping your brush in, the ink gets mixed in with the water. And I keep it filled like this because in case I ever want to do what's called a wash, this is basically watered down ink. It's diluted. Um, it's it's really you know 90% water um, and it's got a little bit of ink that's been mixed in over time off the brush and off the nib so I, I do change it out um, every so often but I, I generally keep it there for a while in case I ever need to do a wash and need gray effects which rarely ever ever do in the style of artwork that that I ink so not only again not only do you work in black but you work in white so what ink do I use to ink in white? My favorite uh, ink here is from Dr. Martin. It is a pen white. Um, it's thin enough to fit within those technical pens, uh, airbrush. Um, and this is was used for blueprints um, a long time ago. Um, it was used for what were called photostats. Um, so I, I don't believe those are being used anymore. Um, I like it. I like the way it flows off my nib. It, it works really well with the nib. I can't find this this particular label and design very often. Um, it's very difficult to find now for me. So when I do, I get excited because, <laughs> uh, like I mentioned, form a creature habit. I like to stick with what I know is going to work, um, and this is um, what I like. But I believe Dr. Martin um, has uh, relabeled it. This right here is basically the same thing. I mean, it's the same consistency. Um, it works basically the same, and it's now called Bombay White 
India ink, um, and it's actually half the price. Um, so um, I'm assuming it's, it's, I guess over the time, uh, it's not being used as often, so maybe that's why the price has gone down. Um, who knows, uh, but this here uh, can be found um, pretty regularly. This, is, this is, was easy to find, but if I can, I would like to find some of these online and stock up on them. So you can see they have a little, uh, a little teardrop, um, little you know, tear, uh, little like eyedropper thing, and and you can squeeze out the ink and drop it into something else. I actually poured it into a second jar of the Windsor and Newton. I bought the Windsor and Newton white ink, but I don't like their. Um, I don't like the Windsor Noon inks, you know, for my tech pens and for my brush. So I put that Dr. Martin ink in here. And then, you know, the, the ink settles at the bottom. The reason why I shook it up so that it mixes. Because then you get the oils up top and the ink down below or the water. Um, but so I poured in this, this little jar for the same reason. It is portable to eat. You know, I can move it around. Um, I don't have to have a whole large bottle of ink at one time the wide base and this works really well i can dip brush and nib uh into this jar generally i just use nib with that when i work with brush and i want to correct mistakes because i'm not perfect um surprise right we're gonna make mistakes so uh i use um a pro white um this is a, a an opaque white it is it comes in almost like a powder uh, inside and you dilute it with water and you get the, the consistency that, that you're looking for. Um, and what I do is, um, keep, I just work with it in this jar. I, I pour water into it every now and then before I'm gonna use it, I'll pour some more water because water does evapor evaporate, especially here in Texas where it can get really hot. So, I just dip my brush in there. And this is really just used. I really only use this with brush. Um, I like to keep it a little thicker, so the less layer I put on, it will cover the ink, um, and it covers the mistake. And you can see as it dries, it kind of gets a little flake on there. Not only when I go to the grocery store, not only do I buy the um the jars of baby food um while you're there you may also want to pick up an extra toothbrush um not that you know you know inkers need uh you know not that inking gives you bad breath or cavities um you pick up an extra toothbrush and you can use it for and this one it it looks clear because i used the white on this and i use that opaque white that you just saw right here or sometimes that pearl white and i put put it on the end of the toothbrush and I can flick the toothbrush. And depending on the how hard I flick this brush or where or how many bristles I use to flip, flick it and how much white ink I have on there will control the amount of splatter that I have. Um, that I, you know, splatter that, that, that comes out based on how much ink I have on the, on the bristles on here. And I have um, one for black ink as well. Um, so not just one for um, not not one just for you know the white one for um, black and I think honestly I think I ended up with this purple toothbrush I think because my I think my daughter left over uh, one of her toothbrushes and um, I, I want to say um, I think she ended up bringing several toothbrushes and I think she left over one of them and so I because I, I don't think I would have bought a purple one. But uh, so I ended up using this. This was her, her old toothbrush and stuff. And in case you're wondering, my daughter is the one on my channel where it says teenage girl in a child car seat prank. Um, that was my daughter back when she was a, a young teenager. Uh, and uh, now she's a young adult. And uh, so we like to have fun. We like to, I, I like to joke around a lot. So when you're working with ink, um, you're, you're going to get ink on your hands. It's, it's almost inevitable. Inevitable. It happens. 
So uh, to clean the ink off of your hands, uh, this company here, um, the Masters Artist Soap, uh, this actually will clean out uh, paint. It'll it'll clean uh, even the ink stains. If you were to spill ink on your shirt or your pants, you just soak it in water and you rub this against there, and it actually takes out a lot. Um, takes out dyes, grease. I mean, it's it really works well, and it's got a minty smell to it. When you open it up, it's a green bar. It's got a lot of little grains in it. And when you wash your hands, it will dry your hands. So my hands get dry a lot because of this artist soap. But I try to keep my hands clean when I'm leaving the house because you will get black under your nails. And it will look like you got dirty fingernails and they, they get stained. Um, and there's different type of preventatives, different type of little gloves that painters use and stuff. But um, I, don't, I find it unnecessary. I just use that soap. And they also make soap for your brushes because you want to preserve the life of your brush. You want to take care of your brush um, because uh, uh, we're not working in, um, we're working with India ink on the brush so it will dry and clump on, on your brush. So the Masters uh, makes a brush cleaner and preserver. And when you open it up, it's a white paste. And I put uh, water on the very top and I kind of let like a pool of water on there. And then what I do with it is that um, under water, when I'll, I will also let a little bit of the, uh, the tap water run, just kind of drip a little so that it, once that pulls there, it's pouring out just a little bit of water and I will rotate my brush in there as that water is kind of lightly overflowing and it washes and it rinses it and it, the ink runs off and then I stop the tap while this is wet uh, with water or damp. I'll shake my brush till I get it to a nice point, And then I'll store my brush away, allowing this paste to dry on there so that it reshapes my brush. Um, and then when I'm about to use it, I dip it in those baby food jars and it washes right off. And this paste has a really nice smell to it as I'm opening it. Mm, I can smell the mint to it. It has like a, a neat smell this is what you see here below it is the exact same thing this is actually the um, brush cleaner that I'm actually using right now I haven't moved on to the larger one yet I just this is portable you can see the ink stains in there and the swirl marks where I've been using the brush I just use this because it's so much easier to take such a tiny little case to the sink with my brush and when you're working with ink and you're washing out brushes better to use it over a, a metal sink, you know, a stainless steel sink rather than, uh, you know, any type of like ceramic sink because it, it, the ink will stain. And then your wife, girlfriend, or mom, whoever, depending on who you live with, they're, uh, they're going to get really upset. So one of the things that I, um, something that I use very, very often, and uh, I'll show an example right over here. You can see on the left of the screen is the Bristol board and I tape it down I don't work with it if you watch the video as I'm inking I'm actually rotating my page a lot because the direction that I prefer to throw my line in so I rotate my page but when I don't need to rotate it and I don't want my page to slide off the table you know if I don't stick it with the tape it will actually slide down on the incline Let's see if we can get it here on camera so I use that and that is actually a low adhesive artist tape you want a low adhesive artist tape so that when you peel it like this, it doesn't peel up any of the artboard and it's, it's really low adhesive um, and it peels up. And what I do is if I want to make it even uh, less adhesive, because here in Texas it gets pretty hot, so the tape gets, the adhesive gets really sticky. I will actually stick it to my shirt um, before I use it on the artboard because I don't want to tear the artboard. I want to try to keep the original as neat looking as I can for presentation or possibly for selling the original. Um, so I place it on my shirt, peel it back up and it loses even more of the adhesive um, underneath. And then I stick it to the page. Uh, and this is actually, it's actually called artist tape and it has a low adhesive tape. Um, and I have two, I have two different brands. I have uh, the Scotch brand um, and it comes with its own little case 
Um, but I also found one from a, um, a brand that's less expensive and uh, it came in its own little roll and I placed it inside of a scotch uh, uh, you know holder here and um, so uh, that it's right next to my desk and I, I actually use that much more often than I use this brand only because uh, it, it's not as convenient to have this around and and slide and peel you know it's so much easier with the heavier case so what I sometimes will use it for is whenever I need to do a straight edge um, a line and I don't want my page to move so I will tape it on the right and I will tape it over on the left so that the page remains and I can move my straight edge around and uh, use the straight edge and a nib to do all my technical work or my borders or panels so when you're doing um, straight lines and you're working with uh, a nib um, or even if you're using technical pins you're gonna want a straight edge this this straight edge right here is, is small it's convenient um, so that it's portable or whenever I just need to do a small line and I don't want this you know huge you know two foot um, straight edge Underneath it has a, a cork base um, and so that it keeps it from sliding off my table. And a good thing about that is that for as inkers, you want to have it elevate. So you see that cork underneath doesn't allow the ruler to lay flat and that will allow some space underneath. So as I drag my nib and use the straight edge as a guide for that straight line, the ink won't run underneath and it won't smear um, because I put it against the side and then I use it as a guide um, and there's several different ways um, you don't you can lay it flat and then just use it as your guide or if you feel more comfortable you can angle it with your fingers where you, you kind of do like a little bit of a lift so that there's a little space and I generally use the top and I put just a tiny little bit of space so that the ink can can flow smoothly. I'm sorry, I mean the nib can slide smoothly against the straight edge. And I can show tutorials on how I do all the straight lines and how I how I don't use technical pins, how I use the, the nib for all the, the technical work. Um, I can do a tutorial on that. Um, so I have several different straight edges. Um, I have a much larger, I'm sorry about that, bumping the camera, making, uh, making you dizzy, hopefully, uh, you're not dizzy. So I have a much larger straight edge with the same ruler underneath, it's stainless steel, it's got weight to it so it doesn't slide, um, but stainless steel, you know, it's good because then it stays straight, um, I can slide along the end of it with the, uh, the nib without scratching and putting dents into the, the straight edge but sometimes you want to be able to see through your ruler so that you can see the lines that you've previously have placed um, so I would recommend a straight edge that is plastic and see-through um, this particular one as you can see is flat on one side and then beveled on the other this side here kind of has a uh, a bevel to it and the bottom piece is actually um, flat so it's supposed to be used this way and then there's a bevel in but I found that I could flip it upside down and it gives me uh, like an inking edge it gives me a raised uh, lip and uh, so I can slide with my nib um, right across and this ruler was I think about three dollars really wasn't very expensive where the much larger one was nine dollars this one right here was three dollars so I can just place this one upside down and I can actually just do all my ink work without having to tilt it or, or raise it but um, you can you can take any straight edge kind of angle it with your finger just a little bit slide it another trick that uh, inkers do and it's an old trick um, is that they will actually take some pennies and they will tape it on the underneath on the end to help raise their their uh, their rulers or their French curves and uh, if you're a baller you can put tape some uh, silver dollars under there I don't like taping anything underneath mine 
um, because I like to be able to work with the entire tool, move it around, you know, where the pennies could kind of bump things. And I, I just like it like this. So I, I try to find little things like this that I always look for those beveled edges and things that are raised a little bit. If not, just simply using your finger works. Uh, but it's all preference. So if you want to, try taping the pennies on there. Underneath, you don't need to tape very many. And um, that may work for you. Um, another thing that you want to invest in uh, as an inker is because you don't want to freehand circles um, unless it's something organic and that uh, you're, you're trying to draw the moon or, um, you know, or it's intentional and you, you want a, a shaky circle. So if you don't want a shaky circle and you need, you know, a smooth um, guide, these um, templates are, are, really, are really helpful. This is by the German brand uh, uh, Stadler. Um, this is their large circle and they have many different ones. They have ellipses and ellipses are just uh, circles that are kind of like squeezed in a little. They're, um, and I would recommend investing in these. They're very expensive. Um, just this one right here, I believe it was like $11 or so. Um, so I, I only have a few, I, I have a handful of, of these circles. But whenever I need to make a larger circle, you know, um, there's different things you could do. You could get a plate, uh, a dish plate from your kitchen. You know, again, ask your mom, girlfriend, or wife, depending on how old you are, who you live with. Make sure it's okay and don't use your good china um, to do, use it as a guide and, and do circles. Uh, you can take a CD, um, and some of you who are younger are probably like, what's a CD? Um, Let's see, CDs like a DVD or your PlayStation games. <laughs> so you can take an old disc uh, and use it as a guide um, to get larger circles. You can get creative. Um, I invested into the, um, I, I seem to favor Stadler. Um, they make so many things that, that I use. Um, I know they're not paying me, um, but uh, I like a lot of their equipment. So uh, this is a compass. Uh, this is a nine piece compass. Um, and it's about $20 or so. Um, so with this, um, and this one right now, the last time I used it, um, not too long ago, uh, I was working on my creator on project that I'm, I'm slowly, uh, putting together. Um, and I drew a large moon with it. Um, and I put the two millimeter, it holds their two millimeter lead that um, they also have a, a lead holder. And I'll also show that when I do a video for supplies for a penciler. But just to show you real quick, this is my actual penciling um, holder. This is where what I used to pencil with. And the exact same lid I was able to place on there, the same grade of lid. And uh, same lid, you know, just a little piece goes on there and I was able to, I can sharpen that with the, the lid sharpener. The other side of this compass has a metal pin. That metal pin will push into the paper and it will stick into the paper. And as you are going around with this little handle right here, it rotates around. And uh, that's how you make circles. Now for an inker, because that's what we are talking about today, supplies for an inker, is you have an inking tip right here. And you dip that in ink. And then as you put it in, to the end of your compass, because it's interchangeable, then you can uh, ink circles. Uh, they also have several sizes. You've got a smaller compass, uh, the medium and the larger compass. And in case you need to make a circle that's even larger than that, they sell an extension that goes on the, the end of it right here. And that will extend the, uh, the line, if you can see that to make even larger. So you can make circles all the same uh, size as the template back here with just this one uh, uh, set here, compass set, it's a nine piece compass set. So on the end, these two are, are all interchangeable and you can place the, um, the inking edge on that, the inking tip. And then it comes with holders for your, your lead. You can put your different leads in there. So it's, it's good, you know, to have it and to practice with it um, because uh, 
you know, there is going to come a time where you're going to need to draw uh, ink a, a planet. Um, in some comics, I've seen planets that are on double page spreads, and they are inked with this compass. Now, how do you ink curves, lines that are that take a curve that go around? Well, that is done with a stencil that is called a French curve, and this is what the French curves. Are shaped like multiple different shapes this particular set comes with uh, the inking edge which is what I'm always looking for as an inker I always want beveled raised edge or for it to specifically say um, to have on their inking edge and what that looks like is that on the end it is beveled so you get a little bit of a space in there so that the ink doesn't flow on the end of it and smear underneath. So you can actually take your nib, put this thing flat down on the surface and actually just use it as a guide and ink it. I do several, several different things depending on how comfortable I am. I will then use my finger on there to give me a slight little raise on there just to Give me a space, just a little bit of space there. And then I can use it as a guide uh, to ink on there. Now, there is uh, another little trick that I will do. As an inker, we do use erasers. This is a kneaded rubber eraser. I will flatten it out, it's kind of like putty. And then I place it underneath and I stick it to the French curve so that it gives me a little bit more of, a, of a, a raise on that, raises it off the artboard or the paper. And kneaded rubber won't slide its sticks. So I can even drag the board with it. Um, and then I can just use that, lay it on there, and then use my nib and just slide my nib to get those long curves. Um, so I use the French curve very often so I don't do this so the same thing I don't tape pennies underneath mine you can do that you can tape pennies underneath it but then there are so many of them that I don't want to tape pennies in all of them and then it's difficult to put them back in the box because I like to keep the box and all my tools within arm's reach I like everything to, to stay neat right to my right and as I'm working uh, everything is just right there and I can grab it and continue working. Sometimes you get in that uh, creative flow. Sometimes uh, the nib's working really great, things are going good, and you don't want any interruptions. Um, so that's why I keep everything directly within arm's reach. There's a second option. It's called the flexible curve. And this flexible curve allows you to bend it into any shape that you need. Just in case you can't find a French curve that will bend in the shape that you need or that you're looking for. Um, so you can, you can bend it into different little curves because a lot of times pencilers will freehand things and it's gonna be difficult to find a French curve because most of the time pencilers aren't gonna use a French curve when they when they draw curves, they're just going to freehand it because they're on deadline and they're just trying to get through pages. Uh, of course, they're doing their best work, but, you know, they've got deadlines that uh, they have to meet. So most of the time, their work is going to be freehanded. So you use this flexible curve and uh, use it exact same way you use the French curves. You, you just uh, take your nib and use it as a guide along the edges. Now I did mention that uh, you need to erase. So there are several different type of erasers that I use, um, mostly depending on whether I am penciling or inking. Generally with inking, I'm using the kneaded rubber because it lightens up the pencils for me. Uh, the Mars plastic, uh, it, you know, it, it erases much more, but it leaves a little shaving on, the, uh, on my desk. And I do use, um, I do have these here, the, uh, the Mono Zero 
Um, these are the uh, elastomer erasers, uh, and they take different little little tips that go in there, and you click them, and the same thing. They are um, a Mars plastic, like a plastic uh, eraser inside, and this is actually really cool. When I do a, a penciling tutorial, I will show um, different little neat little effects that I can do. I can take this little tip and take an exacto blade and shape it into a nice little shape and then i can erase smooth little white lines through the um through the graphite of the pencil and then i can erase angled lines with this little angular lines and stuff so i, I sometimes use these as well when i'm inking uh, depending on if i'm inking over the original then i can kind of clean up around the, the sides of the ink without trying to erase too much over the ink so that i don't remove ink and then have to go back and touch up uh, ink work, but that it happens. You 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 will have to go back and touch up ink. Um, sometimes when you're erasing, that's why I use the kneaded rubber um, because it's real light on the ink and the graphite. And of course, you're going to want to clean your nibs and your brush or uh, brushes. Um, and I went out and I bought a pair of jeans, um, a small pair of child jeans at a thrift store and they only cost 50 cents at the thrift store so I cut them up into small little sheets and I use them to clean my nibs and my brush. I use masking tape to tape it onto the end of my desk so that it's really handy and it's there every time I need it to clean off the excess ink and um, any type of uh, crusty little uh, flakes of ink that are blocking the, um, the ink well and making it difficult for the ink to flow off the nib. Um, most of the time, you're gonna receive artwork that is, once you start working professionally, most of the time you're gonna receive artwork that is original and it's gonna have pencils on there. And then you ink directly over the pencil, but sometimes you're gonna work with an artist who's international or you're gonna work with a smaller publisher and I've done that. I've worked with a lot smaller publishers, as you saw earlier. The one that I did with the uh, creator of, um, of Underworld, the movies, uh, with Kevin Grievous. He um, created a zombie book, and uh, that's one of the books that I, I had inked. And so what made it easier was that we worked electronically, and I received um, the artwork through, uh, back then it was an FTP. Uh, it was File Transfer Protocol. Um, and that's how we transfer files. Today, you can use uh, Dropbox. Uh, sometimes uh, publishers, even DC Comics has a website and you go to their site and you upload and download uh, files. So when you receive the file, you're gonna need to print it. Um, and I, how I printed this was I went ahead and I purchased um, an artboard. And uh, there are several Different, several different art boards. This is a 300 series, and uh, all the boards are going to be Bristol board, and it comes up to your preference and what you want to ink. Uh, there is a smooth surface Bristol board, and there is a vellum Bristol board. The vellum is going to have what we call a tooth. That means it's going to be just a little uh, texture on the surface. Um, and generally, I, I like using vellum when I pencil because I can feel where I'm drawing, but when I'm inking, I want a smooth artboard. Um, and Strathmore makes a uh, even smoother artboard in their 500 series. That surface is called plate. Plate is just really smooth um, surface and, and it, uh, it even holds the ink very well. So uh, this is their 400 series and they're color coded as you can see the yellow pad um, is in uh, the 300 is in yellow the 400 series is in brown um, and I'm not sure what the 500 series is because I, I don't use the 500 series because uh, it's much more expensive and um, I just don't see spending that much more money when the 400 series uh, works well for me and it holds the ink and, and uh, I don't get as many fibers with the nib it works well with the nib the 400 series comes in a much larger pad where if you're going to um, be experimenting and, and just trying out and you want blank sheets of Bristol board, the 300 series is already pre-cut and you can see it's already 
marketed and advertised towards artists, comic book artists. And so when you open up the art pad, it's blank and it's already sized for you. So you can start inking on that, even a blank sheet, take it and start practicing with the nib, just random different lines, you know, get used to the, the way the nib and uh, how much ink to put on your nib because based on how much ink is on the nib um, will, will depend on the type of line that you're putting down the type of control and, and that comes over time so you can practice over that but if you're working and you want uh, a quality paper the 400 series does not come in uh, 11 by 17 sheets as far, I mean, in, in the sheets don't come in, the, the art pad does not come in the 11 by 17, which is the standard size that uh, American comic books uh, paper uh, is 11 by 17. The image area that you draw on means your drawing area is 10 by 15. Um, and that's basically the size of a comic book scaled larger. Um, and then comic pages, you know, they, they're scaled down. Um, so you're actually working on originals at a much larger scale for the detail. Um, so the art pad was 14 by 17. Just slice the uh, art pad to 11 by 17, taking off three inches off the side. So I keep the extra piece because then I repurpose it. The extra piece um, that are inside, I will then peel off the, the art uh, board and then I cut it to a smaller size like this and then I tape it on the side of my, my desk where I'm working where I'm inking here and then I tape it to the right so that I can do a little uh, I can wear off the excess of ink that's on my brush or scratch off little fibers off my nib or I can uh, test my nib on the side and so it, it makes really good um, to have uh, scrap pieces of, of uh, the artboard right here. Now if you're going to work um, electronically, um, as I mentioned, where um, you want to print pages like this. Um, so what I use is I use a program called Adobe Photoshop. So you, you want to uh, have access to uh, Adobe Photoshop. You're going to need a, a large flatbed scanner that can scan in the image all in one pass. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and show you my printer um, and uh, what I use to print these these out right here. Um, I even print out my own templates. Um, I will print out um, my logo, I print out my own, my own template, and then uh, I do my, my drawings um, within my, my own templates that are actually uh, the correct exact measurements um, on here that uh, I believe this one right here I, I used the same measurements that were on a Marvel comic uh, artboard and uh, so you can print out your own customized uh, artboards and that's that's how I do it so let's go ahead and uh, take a look at, uh, at my printer and uh, see how I print these okay so here we have my Epson workforce 7620 it's a printer fax uh, scanner combo uh, and it is large enough to scan in the entire 11 by 17 artwork uh, and as you see here um, once you're done with your your drawing in this case here I've got my drawing placed um, on the scanner and what I do is I then place it into the scanner of course it is supposed to be placed face down this is just to give you an idea of uh, how the entire 11 by 17 fits in there and you close your scanner and then you scan it in Photoshop um, you take the image and you make it into uh, a uh, non photo blue uh, by doing a dual tone and then take it back into RGB once I have that blue line artwork I take a blank sheet of paper of Bristol board and it is fed through the back of my printer then it will then go through and the printer will then process it put the illustration out and print it on the bristol board in the non-photo blue so as you can see i will take the penciled illustration 
that I have done here. And this is of my uh, creator own project called Veil of Night. So um, this is an illustration I had done. Then I can then print it up on knit into non photo blue and uh, then it's printed directly on there. So if you receive artwork that is uh, electronically, you get a high enough resolution and you can print it with the uh, Epson workforce. And that's uh, what I use. Well, this is the uh, look at my workstation and a uh, inside to the tools that I use. Again, there are many different brands. Uh, experiment with different tools. Find what you are comfortable with. Um, and definitely, you know, uh, talk to as many inkers as you can. Uh, there's going to be different techniques and different tricks that uh, vary from artist to artist. But the uh, uniformed and, and standard is going to be a brush and is going to be a Kalinsky sable and uh, a nib. Uh, those two are pretty standard across um, brands uh, vary, types of inks vary from artist to artist. So again, my name is Jimmy Reyes, I'm a comic book artist, and if you would like to uh, contact me, um, I'm on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Jimmy Reyes Art. Uh, I have a Deviant Art page, which has my pencil work on there, uh, and you are welcome to uh, download some of those pencils and practice inking over. You can print them out the way I do. Um, and uh, practice uh, inking over my pencil illustrations. And my Deviant Art page is my name, Jimmy Reyes.deviantart.com. I also have my inking samples on there. I have a few right now, but I'm going to update it with uh, these new samples and going to make some videos as I'm inking. And you'll be able to see the finished work on that Deviant Art page. Uh, also, again, uh, thank you so much for viewing the video. Please take the time to comment and rate the video on YouTube. And don't forget, keep inking. You're only going to get better with practice and practice. Thank you so much.